multi-tenant architecture is common in today's web applications, so I'm going to show you how to implement multi-tenancy using EF Core in a single database and a multi-database scenario. Let's briefly discuss the difference between a single tenant and a multi-tenant architecture. In a single tenant architecture, each user has dedicated compute and storage resources. In a multi-tenant scenario, multiple users are going to share the compute and the storage resources in your system. This is practical in software as a service applications where many users are going to be using the same system. Now let's see how we can add support for multi-tenancy using EF Core. I have a simple data model with two tables in the database. We have a company which contains an ID name and tenant ID. This column represents which tenant the company belongs to. And we also have a concept of a sale, which is going to belong to a particular company under the specific tenant. It also has some contextual information, which isn't really important for us. We want to make sure that when somebody is querying the company's endpoint in our API, they can only see the company information for their tenant. And the same applies when they are querying the sales for a particular company, they can only see the sales that belong to their tenant. This also includes the company itself. So let me first show you why the current setup is problematic. If I try to query the company with the ID of six, you're going to see that I will get back the company details. And then if I try to query the company with an ID of seven or an ID of eight, I'm also going to get back the company details, but the tenant ID changes. And I can do the same in the sales endpoint. I can just specify the company ID that I want and I'm going to get back the sales for different tenants. If I try to change the company ID, you'll notice that the tenant ID also changes. So we want to prevent this and do it in a way that doesn't change our API surface. So let me show you how to do this. I'm going to create a new service in my application that's going to help me determine who the current tenant is. So let me define a services folder and I'll create a new class inside that I will call the tenant provider. The tenant provider is going to tell me who the current tenant is. And I'm going to inject an IHTTP context accessor to be able to determine this. This is because I'm going to pass the tenant ID inside of a custom header. So let me define a constant that's going to represent my tenant ID header name. And I'm going to give it a value of X tenant ID. I'm going to inject the HTTP context accessor from the constructor and then I can expose a method that's going to return an integer representing my tenant ID and let's call it the get tenant ID. Now I'm going to use my HTTP context accessor to get my tenant ID header. So I'm going to say HTTP context accessor and then access the context instance. Then I need to look for the request and I'm interested in the request headers. This is a dictionary and I can pass the tenant ID header name as the key and I'm going to get back a tenant ID header if it exists. Then I can say if the tenant ID header does not have a value, I can decide to, for example, throw an exception if I don't want to support accessing the application without a tenant ID. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to throw a new application exception and I'm going to say tenant ID is not present. If the tenant ID header is present, I'm going to try to parse it into an integer. So I'll say int try parse. I'm going to give it the tenant ID header value and I'm going to get back a tenant ID as an integer. And then I can go ahead and return the tenant ID value from this method. Additionally, I can validate the tenant ID against an existing list of tenant IDs. I hard coded some for this example. There are five of them, but these values would typically be in a central configuration store or even a database. So what I can do inside of my tenant provider is add an additional check if the tenants, and then I can access all of the tenants and check if it contains the tenant ID that we parsed from the tenant ID header. So if any of these conditions evaluates to false, we're going to throw an exception because we have an invalid tenant ID. Otherwise, we manage to parse the tenant ID successfully and we can return it from this method. The next thing I need to do is to register this with dependency injection. So I'm going to do that right here. First of all, I'm going to add the HTTP context accessor services, and then I'm going to register my tenant provider 
as a scoped service. And this is important because I can only access the HTTP context during an HTTP request. Otherwise, it's going to be null and we're going to throw an exception. And now that I've configured this with dependency injection, I can use it inside of my application database context. So I can inject the tenant provider as any other service. So let me go ahead and define the tenant provider. And I'm going to inject it inside of a tenant provider field. And I'm also going to create a private read-only integer variable that's going to hold the tenant ID. And I'm going to assign the tenant ID also from the constructor by accessing the tenant provider service and calling the get tenant ID method. I'm going to leave the service for later when we are discussing a multi-database scenario. And now I'm going to show you how to use the tenant ID to apply filtering for our database queries. So let me update my NED configuration in the on model creating. I already have an index on the tenant ID column that's going to help me speed up the queries. But what I can also do is define a query filter. This is an EF core feature that allows me to define a query that will always be applied when I am querying particular entities or rather querying the underlying database. So I can define a query filter on the tenant ID column and I already have the tenant ID value which I got from my HTTP request context. So I can define a query filter like this and I'm going to do the same in the case of a sale. So now I can say builder has query filter and specify the tenant ID as the query filter argument. And this will make sure that all of our queries are filtered based on the tenant. So let's see how this changes the functionality of our API. I've got an API response from our earlier example where we fetched the company with the ID of eight and we know that the tenant ID is free. So now I'm going to add the tenant ID header and specify the tenant ID of let's say one and try to run the same request again. And you'll see that this time we get a 404 not found because we have a tenant ID mismatch. If I update the tenant ID to free, which also matches the tenant that this company belongs to and send this request, you'll see that we get back the company information. To show you how this works in the background, let's send another request and we hit the breakpoint inside of the tenant provider service and we are running in the get tenant ID method. So we're first going to fetch our header, which contains the value of our tenant ID. And then we're going to parse that into an integer value and configure that as the query filter. Only then am I going to enter my endpoint and try to run my database query and notice that I'm still only filtering by the company ID. I'm not specifying the tenant ID anywhere inside of this query. And when I execute this, I'm going to get back a company from the database. But if we take a look at the logs, we can see the query that EF Core is sending to the database. And this part is our company ID filter. But this part here is our query filter, which makes sure to apply the tenant ID condition. And you can even see it has a parameter name with EF filter so that you know that this is something that's automatically applied. So let me return the response to Postman. And I'm going to show you that the same logic works when we are querying the sales. So you can see that I'm trying to fetch the sales for the company ID of nine with a tenant ID of four, but I'm specifying the tenant ID of one in the tenant ID header. So if I send this request, we won't get back any information. If I update the tenant ID, to match the company's tenant ID, then we're going to get the data back from the API. So you can see that it is straightforward to implement multi-tenancy in a single database scenario, but how do we make this work if we want to have a dedicated database for one or more tenants? We would need to dynamically update the connection string based on the current tenant and connect to the tenant's database. So I'm also going to show you how you could implement that. Let's start by defining the connections inside of our application settings. I'm going to define a new section here that I will call tenant connection strings. I'm going to define a values inside and then we're going to define key value pairs matching my tenant ID and the respective connection string. So I'm going to copy the connection string value from here and add it as the value of this key value pair and I'm going to change the database that we are connecting to. So I already created a dedicated database in the background and it's called sales one. So let's assign the same database 
to two more tenants. So we're going to use this for the tenants two and three. And then I'm going to configure a different database for the remaining tenants. So this will be the sales two database and it will match the tenants of four and five. Now I need to create a class to make this strongly typed. So I'm going to add a tenant connection strings class and I'm going to define the values inside. This will be a dictionary with an integer key and the string value. I'm going to call it values and I'm going to assign it a default empty value. Then I need to bind this object to my application settings. So I'm going to say builder services configure and I'm going to specify my tenant connection strings and then I'm going to bind the options object value to the configuration section. So I'll say builder configuration get section and I'll say name of tenant connection strings because the value of the section is the same and I'll say bind and give it the options value. I'm also going to adjust how we configure the database context to not specify the connection string anymore because we are going to do this dynamically based on the current tenant. Let's first go to the tenant provider service and define another method inside that's going to return the connection string for the tenant. So let's call it the get connection string. And you'll see that the implementation for this is very straightforward. I'm going to create a private read-only field that's going to contain my tenant connection strings object. Next, I want to inject this from the constructor and I'm going to inject it using the options pattern. So I'll say I options of tenant connection strings and then I need to access the options value. And the implementation of the get connection strings method becomes connection strings and I can just access the values by the tenant ID as the key. So I'll call get tenant ID to get the value back and we're going to return the connection string. And now I can go to my application database context and override the on configuring method. And then I can say options builder use mpg sql because I'm connecting to PostgreSQL under the hood. And I can say tenant provider get connection string to dynamically get the connection string when we are configuring the database context. So I have to make two important remarks with this implementation. First of all, we are fetching the connection string for each tenant from a dictionary. We are storing this dictionary inside of the application settings. So reading the connection string values is going to be really performant. And this is important because we don't want to add latency to our database queries to determine the correct connection string. You don't necessarily have to put this in the application settings. It can be any other form of persistence, but what is important is to make it fast. And then the second comment I want to make is the fact that I'm configuring the connection string to the database dynamically. The onConfiguring method will be called when we are constructing the database context, which will be once per scope and the HTTP request is our scope. So this setup will make it difficult to generate database migrations using this database context. So you might consider having a separate database context for running migrations, but that is outside the scope of this video. So let me show you how our dynamic connection strings are working. I'm going to query the sales for the company ID of nine, but I'm going to specify the tenant ID of one. And this tenant is going to resolve to a database that doesn't contain this company's information. So I don't expect to get back any data. So if I send this request, I'm going to hit the breakpoint inside of my tenant provider service to resolve the connection string. So if we take a look at this dictionary, you'll see that it has five key value pairs and each of them maps one tenant to a connection string. Current tenant ID is one because we specified that in the header. So we're going to assign the appropriate connection string when we configure our database context. And if I hit continue, we're going to run the database query and we won't get back any data. Now, if I update the company ID to something that is inside the same database that the tenant ID of one belongs to, then we are going to get back the appropriate data. Multi-tenant architecture goes well with the modular monolith architecture, and you can learn how to implement modular monoliths by watching this video next. Make sure to smash the like and subscribe buttons, and until next time, stay awesome.